Soho Gathering Place of Santa Barbara's Intelligentsia. This audience and this venue saw me through like some of the better days of my marriage and my younger kids. And what a, what a wonderful place. I mean, a place that does music every night. And, uh, you know, there's not, there's not many places that, that literally have music every night. Community and connection. Soho is a family. Soho has the broadest range of music that any one person could possibly want. It's been the stopping ground, the, you know, the home base for everybody as they come to town. Of course, that's, that's the attraction. Everybody wants to go and hear music at Soho. It's great. So I moved to Santa Barbara in 1996. And I was looking for, you know, what's, what to do, what do you do in Santa Barbara, what's up? And so I looked in the local weekly newspaper, The Independent, and uh, saw that there was this club called Soho, and they had this band that I'd heard of called Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. And Big Bad Voodoo Daddy was playing at Soho, and I said, I gotta see him. I didn't know anything about Santa Barbara, let alone Soho. Walked in, looked at the place. At that time, Soho was half the size that it is now and the bar was up in the front. And I looked around and I saw replicated the folk music club that I had been going to when I was in high school. And it just made me feel like this is where I want to come. So I started coming over and over and over again. I think it's like a legitimate theater. I mean, it doesn't have like a giant backstage, but, but it has a big stage where you could host comedians, it could host high school jazz bands as it has, it could host, you know, a rock bands and be a club. It can even do multiple things on the same night. It couldn't be a warmer, friendlier place. And I've seen artists that I would never expect to see on this stage. So Michael McDonald and Kenny and Jeff Bridges. Duran Jones and the Indications. They're a uh, um, old school soul band from uh, the Midwest. Glenn Phillips performing here. Donovan, the hurdy-gurdy man himself. And to be able to sit in an intimate room like Soho and see somebody that you've seen at the back of a 5,000 seat theater, amphitheater one time, and be able to see him on right there, and oh, it's once again sublime. Another artist that I never thought I would meet or get to know, that was one of my favorites back in the 60s, he was in a group called Steppenwolf, and the lead singer of that group, and his name, John Kay. I've seen many, many different venues, and the special ones, usually it's because of the people who own and operate it, and to community supporting it, they have a certain aura, I guess you'd say. I mean, for me, and for the people who've come to my shows, they've seen me in all my ups and downs as I've shown up through those years. And, you know, the venue, rearranged here and there, and moved the bar, but it's been the same room and the same layout, and honestly, even a lot of the same people, and so there's a real family to it. Gather your friends, lay down your arms. Gather your friends, lay down your arms. Gather your friends, lay down your arms. Gather your friends, gather your friends. Every time I come here, which which unfortunately isn't often enough. You know, it's just it's just cool and funky and comfortable, and it's exactly what a neighborhood music venue should be. They have nurtured both the community and the artists to want to feel comfortable when they come here and play. I think that's my favorite part of the job, actually, is um, being able to create a relationship with the bands um, as far as hospitality and just making them feel comfortable here. I've been. Hey, I'm a regular there two, three times a week for the last, uh, especially in the last couple of years, Gail invited me to do a photo exhibition of my rock and roll portraiture. It's a collaborative process that, that hopefully is a win-win that gives culture to uh, Soho to share and uh, also, you know, educates the local community as to uh, you know, the musical history of our town and, uh, and the way the club culture has uh, really supported that, of which at the top of that is Gail and Bob. The night that I really met Gail Hansen was a show with um, Ellis Paul and Vance Gilbert. I remember this really clearly. And I sat with some friends. Gail came and sat down and we started talking. She sat right across from me and I just said, oh, this is someone who 
has the same music taste that I've got, the same passion for music. So from that night, we became, uh, you know, really, really close friends. I am Gail Hansen, and I'm the owner of Soho Restaurant and Music Club, along with my husband and my son, Tyler. We've been the owners for 26 years. I've got four kids. All of them have worked here except one. He only plays here. He's a great guitar player. I adore music and I adore people, so I guess that puts me in the right business. <laughs> my husband and I were in the restaurant industry before. Just, just restaurants, no music involved at all. This sort of fell into our lap because a friend had heard that Soho was going under. It only had been here one year. And they had music, uh, not, not to the extent that we have it now, but they did have live music. We liked the fusion of the food with the music, even though the music was just basically trios and combos on a very, you know, on a portable stage, so to speak. So we put in an offer. Gail and Bob asked me if I wanted to be involved, and I said yes. And um, Gail and I were sitting out in the room. We were like, gosh, this would be so cool if this was ours. We were, and then a year later, it's like, oh my God, we did it. Basically, it was a turnkey operation, and I was running the night shifts, and she was waiting tables. It's a restaurant, it's got some music, and I said, well, I can learn the music part of it, and I'm a music fiend anyway. I've been, I played piano my whole life, and I know the words to every song you could name, probably. And I love music. It is just a huge, huge part of my life. And so that part of it was super exciting to me. We used to sleep in the office here. And next, this is when the office was actually the old green room, so it was about 10 feet from stage, and my little brother and I would bring the Nintendo in there and set up and we actually slept overnight. She's mama, Gail's mama, you know? <laughs> and it seems like Gail's been the, the life force behind it, you know? I mean, I know her kids, um, her kids know my kids, it's a whole, you know, and that's, way, that's the way Gail and Bob are. They run, this, they run this place like a family. The band arrives and boom, there's Gail. There's the person we've been working with. That's unusual. Typically it's somebody else doing that. And what's even more unusual is they're in the middle of their show and it's 11 o'clock at night and the place is packed. And, and so they're, you know, they're singing, they're looking out in the crowd and about eight deep, they, they spot Gail. And I mean, that's the thing. She comes to my shows on her night off. And, you know, uh, it's amazing to see her either working the host thing or she's sitting in a chair and having dinner and happy and with her friends who are her patrons. And like, it's pretty special. Gail knows everybody. It's a tough thing to run a business like this. It, it is, it's a labor of love, and that's certainly what Gail puts into it. The reason Soho exists and is vital and is successful is because of Gail. I believe it was Hale that introduced me to Gail, and from that time on, I would see, uh, well, with my limited vision, it wasn't I, I who saw her, it was she who saw me in other places like the Lobera, whatever, and <clears throat> I became really uh, fond of Gail. From every corner, the cry is rising, stand and defend what still remains. The battle's raging, and time is wasting, but if hope dies last, then it's not too late. Uh, 2018, I said to the guys in The Wolf, you know, it's been now 50 years since the first album came out. We've been very lucky, ups and downs, but uh, it's time to call it a day. All right, well, what do you want to do next? Well, that was 2019. I said, well, you know, I'm still playing the guitar. I'm still writing the occasional song. Let me do some solo shows. And I did, and I enjoyed it. And so I thought, well, I'll tell my agencies, uh, go ahead and book me for 2020. Here comes the virus. Oh, wow, that really blows. At the beginning, it's, it's now well documented. When it first started, everyone was really quite frightened. And, you know, that's when the toilet paper binge buying happened and uh, everybody ran, you know, all the supermarket shelves were empty. I would have been on, on the road right now if, uh, if uh, the 
for Polaris and um, I think we were due to do a, a gig in Ojai just this weekend. You know, my shows all got canceled and I was definitely like, ah, this is hard. But then it was really nice for a while because I was like, checked in with old friends and just suddenly found myself at home and built a pergola and like gardened and did all these things that I always wanted, th thought about doing when I wasn't on the road. Yeah, all my summer touring, all my fall touring. All, so my entire year um, of work is it disappeared, as did, you know, our crews, as did our booking agent who's now making delicious smoked meats. The situation throughout the country um, is not good for small clubs. G Gail has, has told me she's surviving, but it, it must be so tough. And, uh, you know, all, uh, all uh, public performance venues are, are closed. And they must be suffering. They must be suffering. Well, in like the first week of March, you know, we started thinking, uh-oh, you know, this is getting serious. Like. You know, we, we might have to close for March, <laughs> you know? That's the weird thing. We, shoot, we might have to close for a whole month. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Around maybe the 15th or 16th of March, it was a pretty like cloudy, dreary day, and we had just decided that uh, we were going to shut our doors for the remainder of the month. I kind of went from working close to 50 hours a week to not working at all, um, and I had been doing those long hours for about six years. I don't think anybody knew really how long this would or will last. First I was like, oh, it's only gonna be a couple of weeks, and then, oh, maybe it's gonna be a month, and now it's gonna be, oh, three months, and now we're thinking it might not be till next year. It's just like, whoa. We're rethinking the whole, everything that we do here, even the combination of food, liquor, music, and how all those play with each other, and is there a component we could do without, and therefore have a scaled down version a Soho that can make its way through um, a scaled-down economy. The economics of a club like this, under the best circumstances, are difficult. And under these circumstances are really, really bad. Soho's big thing was music every night. So not only is it Gail and Bob and of the people who work here, but the huge amount of musicians who this is off their circuit now, whether they're local or traveling. We're gonna need these venues when things open up again. I just wanna do a gig. I just wanna like go to Soho <laughs> and I wanna do or somewhere, you know, and just do the thing that I used to do all the time that I probably was taken for granted because I got a little burned out, um, but it'd be nice to be able to do that again. I miss that. Soho has been this close-knit family yeah, there's one thing you can count on as you come in and there's at least 10 people <laughs> that you would know when you come in, for sure. I've made family out of this place. I've really taken on the role as their fifth child <laughs> over the years. Um, they're my Santa Barbara family. I'm just a, a huge supporter and encourager for, for Gail and Bob and the team. And there's been so many people that have, you know, bumped into me somewhere and be like, we are so ready for so to come back. You're like, we can't wait. When are you guys opening? We should be automatically busy the day we open those doors, and then it's up to us if we can earn back all that loyalty and keep it. Once again, as a culture that has generally undervalued the arts, I think there are, there are rarer and older arts uh, deemed culturally important enough to be subsidized. But in the realm of like anything rock and roll forward, um, that's all got to work in the private sector. We don't get grants, we don't get subsidies, we don't get, you know, touring underwriting, the way literally any other, uh, you know, advanced country does. We don't do that at all. Music is just so transcendent. Um, gets gets a lot of people on the same page who might um, be on a different page at another place in their life. Like Neil Young said in his song Union Man, live music is better. And then another guy says, bumper stickers should be issued, so. <laughs> Nothing's ever gonna replace the experience of an in-person concert. If art is vital to society, then these clubs are vital to the preservation of that art. When we come out of this, people are still gonna need music, they're gonna need the unity it brings them, they're gonna need the um, sense of community it brings them. That's what you really get from a music club, you, you know, you're, you're around people who are richer than you or poorer than you or, you know, look different, but you're all enjoying the same vibe. The things we once believed in, they've all seemed to disappear. Let God and democracy
see what comes next is clear. Foundations start to creak, people start to freak, like we're all doing this year. And when there's nothing left to hold on to, it's just about the fear. It is like an extended family almost, you know. There are so many people and names and faces that, oh yeah, I haven't seen you in six months or I saw you two weeks ago. These are people who consider this place one of those places where they are likely, even if they go by themselves, they're likely to run into somebody, oh, there's so-and-so. This place is as special as they come. If you take all the music out of a, you know, out of a downtown area, um, you're going to see a lot less people wanting to go to that downtown area when it reopens. It's like hugs. You need them both. Live music and hugs. <laughs> it's really, really wonderful to live in a community that has so. Those cattails grew so high in the backyard, all the way to the stream. Catching tadpoles with dad on the Sundays, we made such a good team. We'd take them to the barn, find some water, watch them grow home. But as soon as they got big, we lost them. Just hop right out of that bowl. So hard to hold on to when they tried to escape. So hard to hold on to. They'd always get 